Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 136th session of OLS. Um, today, we have Dr. Heidi Miller. Uh, she is the principal optometrist at University of California Davis Eye Center in Sacramento. She's received her Doctor of Optometry degree from the Southern California, California College of Optometry, where she went on to complete a residency in cornea and contact lenses. Dr. Miller specializes in anterior segment disease and fitting a wide variety of specialty contact lenses. She lectures and publishes on topics related to dry eye, anterior segment disease, and specialty contact lenses. She has contributed to multiple articles for the GP expert column for cornea, a review of cornea and contact lenses and contact lens spectrum. Dr. Miller is also fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society, Scleral Lens Education Society, and serves on the board of the Gas Permeable Lenses Institute. She is the president of the Sacramento Valley Optometric Society, an active member of the California Optometric Association, and was recently awarded the Young Optometrist of the Year for California. Dr. Miller loves giving back to her community by providing eye care services to those in need in Sacramento through California Care Force and in Mexico through Liga International. In her free time, she enjoys traveling with her husband, hiking, water sports, and exploring local breweries or wineries with friends. So with that, uh, Dr. Miller has joined us today to give a talk on pediatric specialty contact lens applications. And with that, I will let you take the screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you again to the online Optum Learning Series for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, it's tonight for me. I know it's different times for you. Um, but to talk a little bit more about pediatric contact lenses and the different applications that you can have in your, your office. I do do some speaking for different companies, but this should have no effect on the talk. So tonight we'll be going through indications for pediatric contact lenses, contact lens options, fitting techniques, and some patient cases at the end. Um, I wish I could have 20 cases because, you know, I have a lot of these patients in my office, but hopefully we'll be able to get through some really unique cases and you'll have some confidence by the end of this talk to really tackle some of these cases that come to your office um, for children that need specialty contact lenses. I wanted to get started with a poll and just get an idea of how often do you fit pediatric patients with specialty contact lenses. Um, I know we have a lot of students on here, so you may have never even fit a contact lens yet, or you may have fit a few uh, kids, but is it one time per month, one time per week, several times per week, or I do not fit pediatric specialty lenses? Yeah, and it's just by looking at this poll right now, it looks like the majority do not fit pediatric specialty lenses, but um, we do have a good mix. There are some that are fitting one per month, one time per week, several times per week. So I think this will be great to get through everything. Yeah, as we anticipated, like uh, pediatric specialty contact lenses is quite rare. So that's most of our participants. Yeah. And it'll be great to well, learn hopefully, from hopefully, yeah. It'll be really interesting just to kind of learn and take some of this back. Um, so I wanted to go through, this is not, you know, this is a big list of indications for applications for contact lenses for pediatrics. Um, most commonly, we think of our aphagic patients that are coming in that need contact lenses, but we can't forget that patients with high myopia, high hyperopia, anisometropia, um, a regular stigmatism can benefit. Also, if we think about prosthetic contact lenses, a lot of times, you know, patients, maybe if they had trauma, will be photophobic, or if they were born aneritic, or with an iris coloboma, they could benefit from a prosthetic contact lens. And, um, and those patients where we're treating amblyopia, if we're unable to get them to be successfully compliant with patching, um, this is something to consider as well, where you can use an opaque occlusive contact lens as an alternative, um, or even putting a high plus contact lens in that non amblyopic eye, in order to help with um, that amblyopic treatment. Contact lenses are a great option for nystagmus patients and also for myopia control. Um, I will not be going into myopia control today because that could be a whole other few hours. But um, like I said, hopefully the cases that I chose will be really unique for you. 
So when we're talking about amblyopia, you know, the prevalence is 2.41% in North America. And so that's a pretty high amount. And just considering, you know, preventable blindness in less in the age group of less than 40 years old, amblyopia is responsible for more vision loss than any other vision loss combined. So that's huge. And what that says to me is that we really need to be making sure that when families come in, that we're encouraging kids to get eye exams um, at a young age, because if we can catch this early and help with treatment, we can help prevent this amblyopia. Risk factors for amblyopia, deprivational. So if a patient's born with cataracts, if they have corneal scarring or a prominent ptosis, these are all reasons that can cause amblyopia. Also, if the child has strabismus or if they have high refractive error or high difference between the two eyes, these are all things that can lead to that greater risk for amblyopia. And so make sure that you're checking for all of these when a patient comes in. The benefits of contact lenses versus spectacles. So first thing, the obvious would be increasing field of view. So in a child that has, you know, a high prescription, they may have thicker lenses and with a frame on top of that, they may feel like they don't have as broad a field of vision. So putting them in a contact lens really expands their field of view as well as helping prevent that anisoconia if they do have difference in prescription in the two eyes. Also, um, if we're talking about magnification or minification for those different prescriptions, contact lenses help reduce those changes in magnification by being on the eye versus um, distance in front of the eye. When we're talking about glasses and how they align on the eye, a lot of times with children, depending on if they're falling off their face, we can get some induced prism. So contact lenses have a benefit in that since they're on the eye, we really reduce that induced prism that can come from poor fitting glasses. And again, we don't have frames that we have to try to keep on their face. So in terms of ensuring that they're getting correction, um, contact lenses can really improve that, especially for a child where they're constantly falling off their face or they're forgetting them at home or they're not using them at all. Anisoconia, the highest risk is refractive anisometropia. So with a patient that has maybe plus in one eye and is myopic in the other eye, we're going to be seeing that um, difference in magnification in the two eyes. And the biggest issue with this is with the greater refractive disparity between the two eyes, we start to lose binocular function. It becomes much more difficult for fusion. You might get eye fatigue. And so these are things that can really be solved with contact lenses, especially when the difference in the disparity between the two eyes becomes greater. So let's take another look with another poll. I feel most comfortable managing pediatrics for traditional soft lenses, ortho K, prosthetic lenses, or sclerals. This is just to kind of give me an idea of what we're doing most in our office when we are working with kiddos. Yeah. So it looks like almost 60 like two thirds are traditional soft contact lenses and we have like one third almost 30 percent fitting ortho k uh so yeah and then no one in sclerals but uh we have a case for you with sclerals so we'll get a little bit into that later on so let's go through the different contact lens options that are available for pediatric patients First, we start with our soft hydrogel and the advantages with the soft lens or soft hydrogel is that you're going to get that good comfort. The lens is going to stay in place, especially, you know, for a normal cornea. The disadvantages can be though that the lenses can be more expensive and we're facing some of that low decay. Um, also, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to handle, especially, you know, if this is a a parent that's putting the lens on the patient's eye and that the child's not cooperative, these can be a little more difficult to handle. And the lenses can tear easily, you know, with parents that are struggling to get the lenses out, especially if you're using these on toddlers, um, you know, that constant attempt of getting the lens out, sometimes these lens can, lenses can tear. And you face more depositing on the surface of the lenses. And you face that risk of infection and extended wear. And that's true with all contact lenses with extended wear, you know, um, you know, if with a soft lens, especially you're having that risk of microbial 
keratitis. So it's really important to have these conversations with parents as you're going through the insertion and removal process. There's going to be days where the parent is so frustrated they can't get that lens out and they do let the child sleep in it. So these are things to keep in mind and just make sure that you're really educating the families on that potential risk. Also, if we're dealing with an irregular cornea, let's say the child had trauma or a corneal transplant or anything that creates a little bit of irregularity to that surface, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to mask that corneal regularity with a soft hydro gel lens. The most common lens that I feel like I hear um, used for managing aphakia is the Bosch and Lam still soft lens. And this lens, you know, is really easy to handle, very easy to see that button on the center of these high plus lenses, especially in the eye. Parents just are able to see exactly where the center of that lens is when they're trying to get it out and put it in. Lens is really comfortable for the patients and it's going to stay in place well. And this lens is approved for 30 days of continuous wear. So especially, like I said, in the beginning time, if the family is struggling, this is a good situation where they could let the child sleep in the lens and you can feel comfortable knowing that it's approved for 30 days continuous wear. It also has a very high DK, very high, very oxygen, um, very good oxygen permeability. But some with the advantages, some of the disadvantages with this lens are you can get poor lens wetting and a lot of lipid buildup. Um, oftentimes with these patients, it's not even that the lens powers change. It's just that the lenses get so gunky. I tell them, okay, we've got to replace that lens. Even if they're taking it out every night and cleaning it really well, they're just more prone to lipid deposition on the surface. And again, they're not going to mask corneal regularity. And one of the biggest things I face when I'm managing a vagic patients with still soft is that they're limited in parameters. So, you know, they only come in three diopter steps few base curve options for the patients and few diameters. So if you end up needing something that's larger, maybe you're having centration issues and you want to go larger in the diameter, you really are limited to the 11, 3, 12, 5 diameter. You cannot customize those parameters and the max power is a plus 32. So if you needed anything higher than that, or if you needed base curves outside of this realm, you will have to switch to a different design lens because we're limited on those different uh, customizations with this lens and is very high cost lens. So for those families that are losing lenses frequently and you know the lens is popping out, they have to replace it often, this can be a financial burden. And a lot of times um, different medical insurances do not have good reimbursement on the lens. So you have to keep this in mind too. Um, but for the families to, if they don't have coverage for these lenses, it could be very costly. Now, prosthetic contact lenses, like I mentioned earlier, they can be used for aniridia and for photophobia, um, even a tinted lens. So if you have a patient that has some sort of achromatopsia, you could order a red magenta brown lens, something that will help dampen that light sensitivity. Um, even if you have a patient that has some sort of retinal disorders that really make them photophobic, these prosthetic lenses can be beneficial to those patients. You can also utilize them to eliminate diplopia. So oftentimes I'm not doing this for a child, but I just wanted to mention that um, because I do have some adult patients that maybe have had a cranial nerve palsy and now they have diplopia. And no, you know, no matter what we try to do with glasses, that diplopia is there. So having an occlusive contact lens that kind of blocks just a portion of the pupil really can help with just eliminating the diplopia altogether and making that patient really comfortable. Um, with that occlusive contact lens in mind, I have done quite a few patients where they've tried patching, they've tried atropine, and it's just really difficult for the families to be compliant um, with amblyopia therapy. And so they've been referred to me to be fit with a contact lens that's completely occlusive. And with this lens, really, I use a lab where we can just tint the whole lens basically black. Um, and as large as possible, we want to make sure that no matter where they're looking, that their eye is going to be completely occluded during that time of patching. And it's utilized the same way you would do a patch, you'd put it in for the hours that are necessary for patching and then take the lens out. Um, you just have to make sure that you keep in mind with these families that you educate them on the risks with contact lenses. And if the vision is very poor in the other eye and you, uh, there's potential 
for having vi permanent vision reduction. You have to outweigh that risk to benefit of should we do be doing a contact lens in the other eye in case something happens. But it is possible. And I've had great success with families who are struggling with amblyopia therapy and having occlusive contact lenses. Um, the other alternative would be using a really high plus or really high minus that essentially just blurs the patient out while, while not having to completely occlude them. Um, so they still are getting that light perception. Gas permeable contact lenses are a great option. And um, I have a lot of families that this is their preference for their child, you know, six months old, eight months old, they're losing those soft lenses like crazy. And they're just not wanting to continue that route because it's too costly and they're having difficulty maintaining with the soft lenses. So I've switched them to gas permeable lenses. And this has been great because, you know, if that lens falls out. They just have to clean it really well and they can reuse that lens. And it also provides great optics, easily, you know, handleable, really high oxygen permeability. We have a lot of material options now with really high DKs. So that makes this option even greater. Um, you also are going to get that enhanced optical quality. So if we were talking about an irregular cornea or maybe a child that had a transplant that had irregularity following that or high corneal astigmatism, we could ma mask and correct that with this gas permeable lens. You will also will have enhanced tear exchange. And again, like I said, easy to handle, very easy for pants to put in and take out and find in the eye. And you have extensive parameters and customization available with GP lenses. We're not limited to one diameter or three base curves. We can completely customize this lens and it can be less expensive for the families. Like I said, gas permeable lenses are, are a very affordable option. And if they're not having to replace the lenses as often because they are able to just clean the lens in the moment, if it falls out or falls on, on a surface that, that they can't just put the lens in right away, um, they can clean the lens. For, if they lose a soft lens and they find it an hour later, it's dried out and it's probably not great to reuse that lens. But some of the disadvantages are the child might have some initial lens awareness. There's gonna be some adaptation period and um, the lens can get dislocated. And on our end as practitioners, it does take a little bit more skill when you're putting the lens on because you do need and a little bit more time in the sense that you wanna check the fluorescing patterns. You might have to do modifications to customize it a little bit more. But um, I will tell you in terms of when you're comparing to an adult, lens awareness is not really a huge thing that children will complain about. They'll get used to lens pretty quickly. Um, and you'll be able to kind of assess how they're behaving. You know, if parents are saying they're rubbing their eyes a lot, it's watering, it's getting irritated. Those will all be indications that maybe something needs to be modified, but it's really easy in office to just put some fluorescein, shine a blue light, see how it's looking on the eye and make some modifications based off that without even having to get behind the slit lamp. So if you are going to be doing GP lens fittings in office, um, some essentials that you should have are a handheld keratometer autorefactor, and that's if it's available. It's that one's not you know required, but that can be really helpful to get some initial case for you. You definitely want to try to measure the corneal diameter so you have a little bit of a reference point of where you're going to start, and some sort of diagnostic gas permeable lenses in office. It's so much easier to throw a lens in on the eye and see where you're at as a starting point where to modify versus trying to empirically order. Um, in my experience, um, you also want to have fluorescein strips to do that fluorescein assessment and some sort of Burton lamp or blue pen light. You're never going to be putting these kids behind slit lamps um, when they're young. Maybe if they're, you know, eight and older, you might, but we really can do everything outside the slit lamp or and even using like a handheld 20 diopter with a pen light if you needed more magnification. Uh, I really am able to just do it outside of the slit lamp with a blue light shine on there, see, have them blink, look around and kind of assess it that way as well. You want to have loose trial lenses or a lens bar because everything we're going to be doing is with retinoscopy for the most part. Uh, never going to be throwing them behind a four after and definitely want to have toys with noise or some sort of movies for distraction because it's going to take a team. If you know, you'll have the parents in there kind of helping distract, get their attention. If they're the ones holding the patient, you might have your technician come in and be the one that's your right hand man to help with keeping attention for the patient and we have to move quickly. 
I have the luxury that I work in a hospital. And so sometimes we have those patients where, you know, they come in several times and the cooperation's not there. They're crying. We can't get any views. And this is when um, I co-manage very closely with the pediatric ophthalmologist. We end up deciding, okay, it's time to do an exam under anesthesia. And so will everybody that's part of that eye care team, whether the patient has glaucoma, you know, pedi the pediatric ophthalmologist, myself, we'll go in together so we can all get our measurements at the same time. And I'll get my corneal measurements at that visit, um, get keratometry values, bring in my lenses to the, the room and do my entire fit and assessment while the patient is under anesthesia. This is not the first kind of line of what we would do, but it is something that I've had to do for a few patients just based off cooperation and how essential it is for us to get good measurements moving forward for either they're either a monocular patient or they have glaucoma and we've all been struggling. So this, this has happened. And like I said, if you're not working in a hospital setting, this will be more difficult to have this opportunity. When you're fitting a GP lens, uh, I just want to let you know that this is a guideline, um, not hard and fast rules, but just a good kind of overview of where to start. Um, I personally do not think that topical anesthetics are necessary for fit and for insertion removal. Oftentimes kids are fussy. It has nothing to do with the lens in their eye or how they're feeling. It's the fear of just being in that exam room and not understanding what's going on, especially for infants. I always tell parents they're going to cry just because it's foreign to them. They have no idea what's going on. It doesn't mean we're hurting them. It doesn't mean, you know, that they're uncomfortable. It's just, you know, unknown territory. And especially if you're working with infants, they're going to cry. So I don't think adding an anesthetic is going to make any difference to that experience. And in fact, it might rile them up sooner than if I would have just put the contact lens in and gotten started. So I don't use anesthetics for my fits or for insertion and removal, but I would say that that's practitioner um, preference. When you're looking at diameter, you usually want to start with a 9.5 to 10 millimeter GP lens. Sometimes it'll go larger. It really depends on the patient's corneal diameter. Um, these lenses are relatively larger than you would maybe for an adult because we're trying to prevent loss. We're trying to make sure that the lenses are centered. And so you start a little bit larger than maybe you would um, could think you would because it's pretty close to something that would be in an adult eye, even though they might be a six month old. Uh, base curve, the, based off of the infantile if they get treatment study protocol, you wanna start with one millimeter to 1.5 millimeter steeper than the flattest K reading. If you were not able to get K readings, I would say start with something around 7.5 millimeters on the base curve and go from there based on how it looks on the eye. Floor, you want to make sure you do a fluorescein assessment. And so, like I said, use your blue light, take a look after you put some fluorescein, see how it's fitting. The goal is the same as if we were fitting an adult. So we want it to be well-centered. We want it to align, have um, I err on the side of minimal apical clearance. Uh, just to make sure that we've got tear exchange under there. And you want to make sure you have adequate edge clearance. So you want to have about a one millimeter band of fluorescein at the edge. If you're looking at it in terms of curves, if you're ordering from the lab, and let's say you started with a 7.5 millimeter base curve, then you kind of want to go maybe 1.5 millimeters flatter as you're starting secondary curves. And when you call your labs, you, you know, you, they'll talk you through it. They'll help you through it with their design. But these are just rough guidelines. And you want to do your retinoscopy to refine the lens power and make sure you're ordering these lenses in the high or hyper decay materials. We're working with kids. And so we want to really make sure they're getting really good oxygen permeability, especially if they accidentally are going to be napping for periods of time with the lens. We want to make sure we're in a really high decay. Just some statistics with pediatric aphakia, congenital cataracts in developed countries ranges from one to three in 10,000. And approximately a third of those are inherited. The remaining causes could be from drug reactions in utero, some systemic diseases, or idiopathic. And generally, cataract extraction will be performed, you know, as early as possible, but um, four to six weeks for unilateral cataracts, if they haven't done it yet, six to eight weeks for bilateral. And usually we'll try to do both at the same time, but if they were not removed simultaneously, then they're going to be removed within a one to two week period. You know, it's really important to get those cataracts out, get contact lenses put on um, to really promote vision 
rehabilitation. And uh, in my setting, the way that the pediatric ophthalmologist co-manage with me is when they remove cataracts, they actually will put a plus 32 still soft in their eye following surgery. Um, and they'll be using their antibiotic drops and all their drops that they're using afterwards for the healing period with the contact lens on. And they are wearing that lens extended wear before they see me. So at least I know when they get to my chair that they've had a contact lens and I'm modifying based off of retinoscopy and what I see there. And, um, we do a really good job of trying to get those patients in pretty quickly after they've had surgery, you know, within a month. So that, um, if any modifications need to be made, if that lens is looking really gunky, that we're replacing it and getting them in the appropriate power that they need. Um, we, Surgeons try to not put an eye well in a patient until they're at minimum two to three years old. In my clinic, if we can get a patient doing really well in contact lenses and they can go into their teenage years, the better. You know, uh, the philosophy with my pediatric ophthalmologist is that the longer we can keep them in contact successfully and their vision's doing well and, you know, if we're doing patching therapy, whatever, if they're doing really well with all of that and it's successful and everyone's compliant in the family, patients doing well, they don't want to push trying to put in an aisle. Well, if they can extend this out of, you know, until they're teenagers, because the longer they wait, the more accurate that IOL implant is going to be. And the less risk we'll be having for complications that can come like glaucoma. So um, really when they're putting implants in those two to three year olds, it's because, you know, contact lenses weren't being successful. Parents were struggling with that. Something had to have been lapsed. Usually they try to wait as long as possible because the eye is continuing to grow. And when they compared contact lenses uh, versus IOLs in studies, the take home was that the binocularity and comparison between IOLs and contact lenses were very comparable. So there's not enough evidence that says a patient that has an eye well is going to be seeing better than someone that's in contact lenses. So it's contact lenses should be continuously recommended. And if we can prolong um, them having eye well implantation until they're older, eyes fully developed and grown, that will be better outcomes for that patient. So poll number three, when managing infants for aphakia, patients should be overcorrected for distance, intermediate, or for near. Yeah, 60% said near and 29% um, said distance and 12% said intermediate. Well, I would like to say all of you are correct because I didn't really specify the age of the patient. Um, but we're going to go through kind of how we modify contact lenses depending on how old the patient is um, as we go through right now. Okay. So when we're fitting for aphakia, typically, you know, contact lens powers are going to range from plus 20 to plus 40, depending on that patient and how soon they got into your office and how old they are. Um, usually in the first month, 80% of the infants are going to require some sort of RX change. So like I mentioned, the pediatric ophthalmologist puts in a plus 32 um, out of surgery, but then by the time they make it to me, they're most likely going to need a change in that prescription. And we can anticipate that there's going to be about five to 10 diopters of change in the first two years of their lives. So to that poll question from the majority of you that said near, when we are dealing with infants in the beginning of treating aphakia, we are correcting the lenses for near. And we want to push for plus three, usually for infants, just because their whole world is up close. We don't need to correct them for far away. They're not... They're not reading the signs as they're in the car driving. Everything is up close. So we want to make sure that they're actually getting visual input. And so we want to make sure that everything's corrected to near. And once they start becoming more mobile, we start to cut back that prescription. And usually we cut it by about a half when they're starting to walk. So we'd overcorrect them by maybe one to one and a half diopters. So that falls into that intermediate that you guys voted for. And then once they're, you know, fully walking and around, you know, two and a half, three years old, we want to make their correction fully for distance. Cause now, you know, they they might be going to preschool. They might, you know, they're getting older. So we want to make them fully for distance and they'll have an overlay bifocal where the top will be Plano and they'll have the full reading ad in the bottom of the glasses. So like I said, you all were correct. It just depends on what aspect of their age work 
dealing with. So correction after two, like I said, usually around two, you know, kids are very mobile at this age. And so we're wanting to prescribe overlays and whether you're cutting it by just one, one and a half, um, or two diopters, that's all going to vary based on the practitioner. I usually try to cut it to a half and then assess at a follow-up. I'm seeing patients back every three to four months and asking the family, how's Jimmy doing? Is he grabbing onto things? Does he look hesitant to grab, you know, to walk around? Does it seem like he's concerned that he's going to trip? Some of that feedback that you get from the parents will dictate whether you need to cut it a little bit more or whether they're doing okay. If they're really hesitant to walk around or they're kind of overstepping or tripping on things, it might be because you still have too much near correction in the contact and we need to cut it back a little bit to give them a, expand a little bit more on their viewing capabilities. Um, and I usually recommend prescribing bifocals. I, I know that some offices will prescribe overlay progressives. I just think for children, I really want to guarantee that they're getting into that near ad. And so by having them bisect the pupil for the bifocal portion, there is no way that the child can look down and not be in the reading ad. So I'm a really big proponent of prescribing bifocals. And whether you do uh, bifocals on both sides for the overlay glasses or one side is really up to the clinician's preference. Um, I usually do unilateral bifocals just so that the fake guy can continue to accommodate freely without creating any sort of unnecessary blur. And in terms of cosmesis or anything like that, usually kids aren't caring at that age and neither have their parents. So um, that's never really a concern for that that we're more concerned about. Are they getting vision improvement and are we maximizing their vision? Poll number four, when we're fitting pediatric patients for aphakia, my go-to lens is a soft hydrogel, a still soft gas permeable lens or scleral. And I think um, this is similar to the other one, but I was just curious specifically to aphakia, what are people using most? <laughs> The scleral lens one is surprising because the previous question said no one had fit a scleral. Um, so maybe we've got some more attendees that just joined us. <laughs> um, but yeah, it looks like a good mix. It looks like a very good mix of different lens options. So, and I would, I would agree. I'm not using sclerals so much for um, aphakics, but I would agree with the other ones that I'm doing a good mix of still soft gas perms and those traditional soft hydrogels and, and certain patients as well. So let's go through quickly um, fitting an aphakic patient, just some an, an example. So, you know, we want to start with the power and that'll be based off of retinoscopy. If the patient's already coming in with like a plus 32, like they would in my office, um, you want to do retinoscopy over and remember that we're trying to over plus the patient because we are correcting them for near. So if you get a plus 26 on retinoscopy, you've got to do your vertex distance for the contact lens equivalent power. And in this example that I put here, that's a plus 37.75. So if we rounded to plus 38, um, and then we added that three diopters of plus that we need for near, we'd end at a plus 41. Well, what did we say about Silsoft? The highest that there is is a plus 32. So if this was a patient where we needed to have a plus 41, we would need to try a different lens. So this is a great option for someone to be in a GP lens because we have unlimited power with that and we can put them in a very high DK lens and they would do great. And then as we need to modify the powers, we can bring it down. And um, I would start there right away. Base curves, these are just some guidelines of what you can expect at birth versus as they get a little bit older. As you can see, there's going to be flattening in the first, you know, years of their life and there's significant flattening in the first six months. So um, you really want to make sure you're following all of these kids, you know, every three months or so, just because there's going to be a lot of changes that are occurring both power wise and to the shape of their cornea. And if we need to be making modifications, we want to make sure that they are not lost to follow up care. Usually their cornea curvature is going to probably stable kind of plateau off around nine months and they'll approach their adult average corneal curvature by around three years old. Again, um, for diameter, 
the average corneal diameter is about 10 millimeters at birth. So when we're fitting these lenses, we're basically fitting it to the full cornea, right? Nine and a half to 10 millimeters in the diameter. Um, most HVID changes in the first year of life will, um, will end up around age three to four being 11.5, except for those that may have some con congenital kind of micro ophthalmia. And then just remember that they're going to have small popular fissures. So and they're going to be kind of screaming and crying. So just keep that in mind when you're fitting the lenses. I think insertion and removal training is one of the most critical aspects. And so you want to make sure that you're doing a really good job of training parents on insertion and removal and making sure that you're answering all their questions, because this is where things can go awry. And if they don't feel confident in office with you, that is where compliance issues can develop. That's where maybe injury, maybe fingernails to the cornea can occur. So you really want to make sure you're review, reviewing technique, lens care, demoing an office with the families, and also making sure that they can show you that they are able to put it in and out before they leave. I don't just give material and say, good luck. I always make sure that my technicians are working with them closely and that the parents are successfully able to insert and remove. If it's going to be mom or dad, I want to see both of them being able to put it in and out while in office because that anxiety and stress of being able to get it out or in is going to be elevated when they're at home by themselves and they don't have someone there that can help. So you want to make sure they're confident in office because that confidence needs to translate into go, when they go home. And I always make sure to give backup spare lenses so that the patient's never left uncorrected. So um, we always can anticipate that a lens is going to be lost. And you want to make sure that especially I have patients that come from two or three hours away. I don't want them to be stressed out that they don't have a backup and they have to wait a week for a lens to come in or we have to mail them one. So really make sure they have a spare lens and that they're calling you as soon as they lose a lens. Follow up schedule wise, you want to see patients, you know, in one to two weeks following your initial INR just to make sure things are going good. I always encourage you to review lens care, review INR, ask them where they're struggling, where they have questions. You can have them come back in one month. That's optional. If, the, if things feel really good with that family and you're like, yeah, they seem on board, everything feels great. Um, have them come back in three months. And then you want to continue that three to four months thereafter. If you're co-managing with pediatric ophthalmologists, you may kind of straddle with their follow-up appointments so that they're doing whatever, you know, I never have to do the dilations for these patients because I co-manage. And so they can have their appointments with them. And then at a different time with me related to the contact lenses, but you want to make sure at each follow-up visit that you're doing an over refraction, you're checking the fit on the eye taking the lens out, examining the cornea and the limbus, making sure there's no issues, making sure the lens doesn't have any chips or um, is not torn and really review symptoms of, that the patient might be having and always review lens care. So let's get into some patient cases. So the first one's a still soft. And I, you know, given that this is really common uh, way to fit a fake it, I thought this was important to review. This was a six month old female. She presented for a contact lens eval and training. She had already had the plus 32 put in her eye coming from surgery, born premature. And that congenital cataract was removed at four weeks. And she's currently patching the right eye two hours daily. Well, her mother is. <laughs> um, exam findings. You can see that this lens is very well centered. Good movement on blink. Over refraction was about a minus 250. So because it's a minus 250, that means she's overcorrected by about two and a half diopters, which is right in that ballpark of where we want patients to be at this age for near correction. She had very heavy, heavy depositing because she was using the Maxitrol and the Cyclogel because she just had surgery. And um, so I replaced that lens in office, but I did not change the power because we were kind of in the ballpark. And as you can see here, you can really see that demarcated button. So for patients or for parents to get this lens out, I always just tell them, you know, you want to use the pads of your fingers and kind of scoop that lens out. Um, and they never really have too much difficulty finding where that lens is if it gets dislodged in the eye. When you're inserting the lens, you want to use your thumb and forefinger and kind of pinch the contact like a taco. I usually say use the palm of your non-dominant hand and stabilize that on the forehead. A lot of times, you know, if you get in the habit of just touching the patient's face, um, and you tell the parents, you know, every day, you know, touch your child's face, get them comfortable so that they know, okay, you know, mom's not hurting me, you know, and they get comfortable with having your hands around that eye. Um, 
but you can stabilize their forehead so they're not moving. Um, you can also, you know, just gently touch around and then you want to use the thumb and the hand to really retract that upper lid, tuck the lens. It's like a taco underneath that upper lid and then pull the lower lid down to kind of allow the lids to close over that um, contact. I always say, you know, once it's in there to just kind of blink the patient, you know, they're probably going to be fussy at this point, but blink them a little bit so we can get the lens, make sure there's no bubbles. You can gently tap on the lid, make sure there's no bubbles. The lens is moving around, but never use your fingernails. So really make sure you're looking at the parent's fingernails. Um, I can't tell you how many times families come in, they're wearing acrylic nails that are really long. And I just say, you know what, you're going to need to remove those for now until you get really comfortable. The acrylics are just not a good call. I don't want you to put child at risk for a scratch. Um, and really tell them when you get frustrated and you're having a hard time getting that lens out, take a deep breath, take a pause. Do not try to force the lens out with your fingernails um, because that's where injury can happen. To remove the lens, you want to use, you know, the two hand method is using upper lower lids and you just kind of put the pads of your fingers onto the eye and scoop the lens out. Uh, you really want to make sure that you tell them to put pressure towards the eyeball. A lot of times parents will do a scooping motion and they're just thinking the lens is going to naturally come out, but they do need to put some pressure on the, the eye in order to um, get the lens out and, and just let them know that that's okay. You know, tell the parent, put some pressure on your own eye. It's not hurting. It's fine. But let them know that they do need to put some sort of pressure when they're taking the lens out. And it's really important to try not to avert the lids. So tell them to really keep the lids flush so that they're not getting averted because that'll make it difficult to get the lens out as well. Our second case is a soft prosthetic contact lens patient, a nine-year-old male. He presented for the prosthetic contact lens eval. So he had already been seen with the pediatric ophthalmologist and for trauma. He had a corneal laceration. He was a fake ecstatic post the globe repair. Um, what they think happened is he had an arrow that ricocheted into his eye. He had a little toy bow and arrow and it ricocheted into his eye. And I think it expelled the, the, the natural lens in the eye. And so he had a dense pupillary membrane B scan with no retinal detachment, but really photophobic. And it was not, it was a light perception eye, but really not seeing eye anymore. And so this kind of shows that initial injury and the surgery that occurred. And you can see that large laceration with the sutures there, a lot of haze, a lot of scarring. So the main goal for this prosthetic lens was to get him more comfortable um, with the photophobia. And also it would help a little bit with cosmetics. So you can see this eye when I was telling him to open his eye, this is as big as he could open his eye, it was still very swollen and uncomfortable. And, you know, I even dimmed the room lights and he was having a hard time opening his eyes. So um, this contact was going to be really beneficial just because if we're blocking a lot of the light, he will be a lot more comfortable. The family did not want to do a, a pupil occluding lens because they wanted to um, still give him light perception. They figured if they wanted a pupil occluding lens for pictures or something like that, they could do that, but they wanted to make sure that he got some sort of light perception, but for the most part, blocking the light to help him be comfortable. So I trialed the Cantor number 13. That was the best color match. There's a lot of different prosthetic lenses out there. I also trialed, trialed Adventures in Colors. Um, Alden Optical has different prosthetic lenses as well. And Orion. Um, with Adventure in Colors, this is a hand-painted lens. So it's a little bit more costly. And because this was the first time they were using a prosthetic contact lens, they opted to just do a computer printed lens, which I think was a very close match to his other eye. And yes, you can still see that white center, but that is because they wanted the pupil to be open so that he was getting light perception. But you can see, you know, that the colors were very closely matching. And even just in this moment in the office, he did feel a lot more comfortable. Um, but, you know, we needed to wait for the swelling to come down and um, go from there. So this is a great option. And we were able to kind of show him all the benefits right there in the office. So the plan from him was just to stick with the prosthetic and down the road, if he wanted to have a pupil occluding lens for cosmetic reasons, we could do that and maybe a hand painted lens if they were really concerned about the match being identical. Case number three. So this patient, she's now four years old, but when I first met her, um, 
She was a seven month old female referred for contact lens evaluation. Her history is she had bilateral corneal opacities. They think she likely Peter's anomaly. So um, she had had transplants in both eyes. The right eye had failed. And so she was just left with a clear transplant in the left eye, but there was some epithelial irregularity, obviously some corneal irregularity from the shape. And she was using all these drops and she had um, implants for glaucoma put in. You, this was her at the initial contact lens eval. So you can see the right eye is opacified. They did not want to try, especially at seven months, to do a new, another transplant surgery for her. So even now, um, they have not done a transplant surgery for her because they figure vision's probably low and um, the likelihood for a successful graft would be low. So they've left, you know, since she's comfortable and quiet, uh, the right eye alone. But this left eye, you can see the nice clear button in the center with that transplant. And so that's the eye that I fit her with the gas permeable lens just a little bit on Peter's anomaly with that, you're going to have incomplete formation of the anterior segment, and it's going to lead to an incomplete separation of the cornea from the iris or the lens, usually bilateral cornea is cloudy, which is why we did a, why they did a corneal transplant on both eyes. And nearly 50% of these individuals are going to have low vision early in life. About 25% are legally blind and they often are associated with glaucoma, cataracts and microphthalmia. So in her case, she is being managed by glaucoma, pediatric ophthalmologist, and um, myself, and also corneal specialist. So she sees a lot of specialists in our department. And so when I fit her for the lens, um, we did have to do an exam on her anesthesia for her. She was not co cooperative at all. And the family um, did get a lot of anxiety at the appointments just from um, the crying and the whole process that they had been to. I think the fact that she's managed for glaucoma and a corneal specialist and every, all the surgeries they had already done, it was very stressful for them. So we decided the best thing for her was to do an examiner anesthesia and the glaucoma doctor and I, and the pediatric specialist all went in so we could get all of our measurements, dilate her, take a look at everything. And so the first lens ordered based off my trial lens assessment, um, was this, uh, post PK oxyflow lens. I ended up changing the color of the lens to gray instead of blue because the mom found it easier to see in the eye and it didn't change her eye color or anything. It just made it easier for them to see when they were taking in and out of the eye. She did have a little bit of bearing. So I ended up having to order a lens with a steeper base curve. And if we fast forward to August, 2020, this is her current lens that she's now wearing and um, she's doing great. I've actually, she's an optimum extreme, which is a high DK material. If we felt like we needed to go to optimum infinite, that is an option now for even higher DK and she's doing great. Um, now that she's a little bit older, I'm able to ask her for acuity and she's 2150 with Allen pictures, um, which is really great considering, you know, all the surgery she's had and given the prognosis of usually being low vision in these patients. And her personality has fully developed. So it's been really great working with her and the family. And she's very cooperative. She likes to come in. She loves getting the fluorescing put in her eye. And I told her she was going to be famous with all of you. So she was like, yes, take my pictures. Um, but you can see how the lens is fitting nice and centered. And it's large. It's almost the whole full size of the corneal diameter. And again, that's to help with centration. Um, it's fit with some apical clearance and uh, good edge lift. And then we have her with an overlay bifocal and she is phakic. She's not a phakic, but because she's low vision, we still have her with that ad to help with the mirror. And you can see how the bifocal is fit a little bit higher than the lid just to guarantee that she's gonna be looking through that segment. So final case here is um, Stevens Johnson syndrome, eight year old female referred for scleral lens evaluation. Uh, this patient, they're not sure how she exactly developed Stevens Johnson. They think it could have been either from ibuprofen or, um, or herpes simplex virus, but she had had amniotic membrane treatments in both eyes, um, and trachiasis in both eyes, which I still epilate her lashes for. And she was using artificial tears four times a day with ointment at night and really, really photosensitive. When she came to me, she could not even open her eyes. Her family told me that the class had her in the dark 
in the back room in the corner because that was the only place she could tolerate and she couldn't tolerate classroom lighting, which was really sad. It was really affecting, you know, her development and her personality. Um, you can see she came in, this was her vision 2150, 2100. So I fit her in a 15-4 scleral lens. Um, I could not go larger than that because she's eight years old and uh, she was very apprehensive. It was really difficult to get the lens in the eye. I was a little concerned that the family wasn't going to be able to, but they were very motivated and we were able to get the lens on her eye over refraction, got her to 2080 and the lens was slightly tight. So I ordered it looser. Just as a quick overview for scleral lenses, you want to make sure you're using lenses that are approved for sclerals and filling the bowl with non-preserved saline is ideal. The Puri lens is good to kind of rinse, but if the patient is not throwing the bottle away every 14 days, you do not want them using that to fill because um, anything that's reusable can start to get contaminants. And with sclerals, we create a semi seal on the eye, kind of like a moisture chamber, and we don't want them to be prone to getting an infection. So she had good comfort with these lenses, well aligned. We had added torque peripheral curves on the contact lenses and loosened up that edge. And after she had been wearing these for three months, you can see her vision improved to 2020. So really the visual acuity was poor just because of how dry she was and because of um, all the inflammation that she had from the Stevens Johnson. And she's still using preservative free tears four times a day. And she still uses the Gentile at night. Um, when she takes her lenses out, she preferred that over the sustained ointment, but she's doing great. And this is a picture of her eye. You can see outside of the scleral lens, there's a little bit of injection because she's still dry out there. And I'm hoping that as she gets older, we can go larger with the scleral lens to cover more surface area on her eye, but she's doing great. She has completely blossomed in her personality as well. And I think a lot of it was just coming with, she was uncomfortable, so photophobic. Um, and they had her sitting in the back corner of a classroom in the dark, which was really sad. And now she can just function and be a part of the class without any issues and not having all these light sensitivity issues at all. So with that, I know I'm getting close to the end here, but uh, let, if there's any questions, I'd love to answer questions and I will put up my slide that has my email. If you ever have any questions or patient cases that you want to bounce ideas off of, or you just want to reach out. Um, this is my personal email and I'm really quick to responding and would love to hear from you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. And very interesting cases, you know, uh, we always think that pediatric contact lens is just either aphakia or myopia management, but there's a lot to it, right? And, and right. looking at your case, it's wonderful that how could you manage all of these uh, kids, especially I like the prosthetic one because that helps uh, a lot uh, for that self confidence as well and you know they can move out without any problem so thank you so much for uh, right. sharing that with us of course thank you something which uh, which uh, you know i wanted to ask you that uh, when it comes to selection of these lenses so is there any particular initial measurements you rely on so you know when when it comes to adult contact lenses we look at the base curve uh, more than anything else because we want to fit on the cornea or you know we want to land properly onto the anterior surface but is there anything different you you rely on in pediatric patients anything uh, you know such as hvid or refractive error or anything you would like to share so i guess it depends on what we're managing if we're talking about a fake yet um or, you know, yeah, if we're talking about a fake yet and you're just going to use a soft lens, I would just throw a lens on and then base off of your retinoscopy. So base kind of off of your assessment of how that lens fitting on the eye and let that drive how you change it. I usually will start with the steepest lens. So a seven and a half, um, 11.3 on the sill soft. If I'm going to use a sill soft and take a look at how that's fitting there. And usually you're going to put them in the highest plus, but once you do your retinoscopy, depending on what you see on the eye, that's how you'll kind of change things mm -hmm. with a GP lens, whether it's aphakic or not, as much information as you can get is great, right? So with an adult, they're cooperative. We can get K's really easily. We can get corneal diameter, but you may not be able to get all that information on a patient. And so um, if you are not able to get that, all that information on a patient, just throw a lens on the eye. So I'd really encourage you to have a diagnostic pediatric set in office. I have one that already has, you know, 
the lens is at, with steep base curves, like a seven and a half, nine and a half to 10 millimeter diameter with high plus variation. So I can at least throw a lens on the eye and have one chance to take a look at that fit and see where I need to modify. And you might end up having to modify a few times because you might only get that one chance at each exam. But if you do big bracketing, you know, you look at the lens, it looks centered, but maybe you're not loving the power or you're not loving the amount of clearance you have make bigger bracketing changes, knowing that um, you're not going to have as much flexibility um, as you will with an adult just because of cooperation. Right. Um, but the key is as long as you're not getting staining, the lens is moving well and the, you know, the power is pretty close to what you need. That's great. We're not looking for perfection. We're just making sure that we're doing our service to get them corrected and that we're not harming the cornea or harming the eye and that they're comfortable. So I would say, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's a little bit more difficult than with adults, but as much information as you can and just throw a lens on the eye and go from there. That's right. I think it does because what happens is we do not, as I was saying that, you know, getting case, getting uh, the measurements, uh, probably the HPID is a bit more easier, but you know, putting on the lens and using your expertise and skills in terms of diagnostic fitting, I think that's the way forward. And, uh, we should definitely have some lenses in our uh, pediatric trial lens set, especially, you know, those uh, steeper base curves, as you were mentioning, because we do understand that uh, kids' corneas uh, are different as, uh, compared to adults. So you probably have to get that diagnostic set, and that would uh, be something which we can take home from here. Right. right. Okay. I did see a question move up here that said, why should the child be overcorrected? Yeah. Oh, that's the one. Sorry. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. So I, I guess it's uh, related to the AFAQ case, if you would uh, want to highlight. Yeah. So, so the, um, I don't know if I fully understand when the child is not supposed to any, to have to be doing any fine near work. Um, we are not, we're working with infants. And so, we're not expecting them to be reading, but we want to make sure that we're providing clear visual input. So with an infant, everything in their world is very near. Their arms are small. Everything here is within inches of their face. Even when you're with holding a child, you're looking at them, your face to the child is very near. We just want them to have visual input. We're not concerned about whether they can read or anything like that, but we want to guarantee visual input. And so we do correct them for near because that's where their world is. Their world is near when they're an infant. As they get older and they become more mobile and they're starting to grab on things, they're starting to walk, we can push that field of view out to intermediate and then ultimately distance to expand where they're corrected. But that's not necessary for a baby. A baby does not need to be seeing the world far away because the world isn't far away. Everything in their world right now is going to be up close. And so that's where we want to provide them clear vision. That's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so so it's basically for the effects, or you would do it for all uh, categories. Is it is it only for the? That's AFIX? only really strictly for effects okay. that we're overcorrecting for near. Mm -hmm. all. all right, okay. And let's just look at another question. In terms and I guess just to just to really quick on that one too, yeah. we have to remember effects cannot do the accommodation themselves. Okay. Right. So that adds that why we're doing that ad power, we want to make it near, but that extra overcorrection is because they are not accommodating yeah. for near, which is why when we correct them for distance, we still need to incorporate that overlay bifocal. Just that's extra great. tidbit. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And even if we prescribe glasses, we do prescribe that plus three ad by default when it comes to bilateral effects, if people are prescribing glasses. So I think the same thing uh, with contact lenses because of less of accommodation. Great. Right. Uh, let's look at another question. How effective, in your opinions, are contact lenses uh, for post graph cornea? I mean, we'll just stick to pediatric post graphs and any experience we, you would like to share uh, on this. Well, um, I think we, if we just think about even adults, you know, because we get feedback from adults when they have transplants, oftentimes it is very difficult for that surgery to be perfect and them to have great vision, right? So that same thing's going to go with a child is that we can anticipate that there's going to be some irregularity, even if we can't get topography or keratometry, there's going to be some irregularity to that transplant because it's very difficult to 
make it so that it's perfect vision. Um, so I do think that contact lenses are going to be really effective. And in that one case that I had with the patient that was a transplant, Peter's anomaly, yes, she's low vision given all the combinations of things going on. Um, but even her at four years old, she's seen 2150 with the pictures up there. We can anticipate maybe it'll get a little bit better, but if she didn't have that lens on, she's not seen 2150. Um, and that may be something that I should add to that PowerPoint is that what is her vision without it so that you can really see the impact of not having a contact versus having the contact on and how it does make a huge difference. So That's thanks for that question. Yeah. And let's look at another question again, because of the overcorrection or because we are giving that added plus, I would probably put as added plus for reading or for near zone. Uh, do you think it affects symmetrization for the infants uh, with AFK? Any any thoughts on this? No, and again, um, because we're seeing them back every three months, and we're going to be modifying the prescription mm. every three months. So, or every time I see them, if there is a change, we're still taking that same thing where we only want to be overcorrecting them about three diopters. So if they come back in and we have an over fraction of minus eight we know we have to do a change in their context prescription. So we're, we're moving along with the changes in their eye at the same time. We're not prescribing one contact and seeing them back in a year. We're seeing them back pretty often. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think the next question, which I think probably came to me only, it's not on the chat, uh, was regarding the follow-up. So uh, the question goes like, uh, does your follow-up for pediatric contact lens patients uh, differ compared to adults and is there any cases for pediatric patients which you see them more often like you know AFA kicks you see often compared to any other cases or do you have a standard protocol? I think um, not I think for my clinic uh, I see all the pediatric patients about every three months not for necessarily the anticipation that we're going to need to change the prescription so in the cases for um well, actually, let me clarify that. So like for the prosthetic case patient, he's being followed by cornea as well as the pediatric ophthalmologist. In his situation, I'm not using the contact for any sort of visual reasons. It's strictly for just photophobia and cosmetics. So in his case, I was not seeing him back every three months. I saw him back in six months, knowing that he's seeing these other providers. And if there's any problem, they would be sending them back to me. Um, but in cases where we're dealing with gas permeable lenses and with children and where there could be changes in the corneal curvature or in the power, I'm seeing them back in three months. And for the scleral lens patient, when you're doing that initial fitting, you're seeing them back several times because you're making modifications to the lens. And usually for any of my scleral patients, and this is true even for an adult, I always see them back at a six month cornea follow up, whether I'm modifying the contact or not, I want to make sure the cornea is doing fine, that the contact's not causing any problems. So I do think when they're younger, it's really important to follow them up closely. Um, if you want to push them out four months, that's fine. But for the eighth fix, it's important because there's a lot of changes that are occurring in, their, in those first couple of years of life. And you want to make sure that you're catching those changes and also providing um, spare lenses if they're losing spare lenses and changing the modality if they're losing lenses a lot and you decide you're going to do a GP. There's a lot of fluidness that's happening with AFAKES. And then if you're managing amblyopia and patching, you just need to see them back more often. Yeah, that's right. And let's take one last question. Again, this one is popping yep. up here. Uh, in terms of solutions, is there anything specific? Uh, which you look for when you are giving, you know, uh, probably lens care products in terms of pediatrics versus adults, something which you, okay, I want to do this only for pediatrics compared to adults. No, not really, but I do have everyone using clear care. And for all of the patients, I also will give them, if they're using a soft lens, I'll also give them fa the families like an opti free or something in case they need to clean in the moment. You know, sometimes they try to put the lens on the eye and the child blinks and it falls on their cheek or it falls on the table, on the couch or something. Um, I want them to have something that they can really clean that lens really well, rub and rinse 
um, before they're putting it back in. But I like to get that good aggressive cleaning with clear care or I know Cooper Vision has their version of a hydrogen peroxide solution. Um, I don't know if overseas there's other versions, but I think hydrogen peroxide solution is really important to just make sure they're getting really clean, um, especially because lipid buildup is really common with children in soft lenses. And I use a uh, hydrogen peroxide solution for gas permeable lenses as well. But again, instead of an OptiFree, I would give them maybe a Boston Sim Plus or something where if they needed a clean in the moment, or if the child's going to, you know, take a nap and they want to take the lens out and have something that they can soak the lens in while they're taking a nap, um, that they have both options. And we make sure we review that very well with the families so that they don't confuse the two. And that's usually um, the case for all the patients for pediatrics. Mm -hmm. right. And just one last, I said I will take this one because it just popped in. Uh, oh, yeah. So how about the oxygen transmission? Do you prescribe higher decay materials always or is there something which, uh, you know, guides you on about how can you maintain the transmission for this patient? Definitely. And, um, and this is even in adults, but definitely I always promote high to hyper DK materials. If you're using GPs, um, I, for any post graph patient, I usually am using a GP. I'm not using a soft lens. And so, yeah, you want to use that high, the high DK or hyper DK. So whether, depending on what labs you work with, you know, you've got the optimum extreme, the infinite there's now, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it. There's uh, several box, Boston XO2, you know, Acuity 200. There's so many hyper DK materials now that you shouldn't be limited. And I think, especially because these are children and they're going to be wearing contact lenses their whole life, the more oxygen, the better. That's right. Yeah. And, and we do also understand that they, they will be wearing for extended hours, right? For adults, they can remove it once they are back. But we want kids to wear these. Yes. You want to prevent them from getting amblyopic. You want them to wear their corrections and all that. So we do understand exactly. that we wear the lenses. So it's good uh, to give them the hyper or the high DK, whichever is, is available at that point of time, right? And with the families, I encourage them all in the trainings to take the lens out every single night. That's how we train them. That's how we encourage them. But we are also realistic. You know, we know, I mean, we see this with adults even, we are realistic that you tell them to take their lenses out and they're going to take a nap in them. And mm -hmm. so just knowing those behaviors, especially with an infant or a toddler where parents are just trying to make sure they're wearing the contact lens and you give them all these steps to do their first, I always tell them for sure to make sure you take it out at night, but there might be those moments, even with the napping that they don't, they forget to take it out. And so we want to make sure that we're really just having the highest oxygen possible for situations like that, where, you know, we tell them to take it out, but sometimes parents forget. Yeah. yeah. And, and even kids, we, sometimes we don't even know when they get tired and fall asleep. So exactly. You know, so exactly. On that as well. Yeah. All right. So I think with that, uh, Dr. Miller, thank you so very much. Uh, I understand it's a very late, uh, evening at your end uh, i think it's probably about 10 now right yeah it's 10 thank it's you. okay it's the weekend for me <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for sharing your experience i think uh, the cases as well as you know answering the questions and guiding us to i think with this uh, probably you know some of the attendees would get uh, the inspiration you know it's not just myopia control not just afaka afaka but it's a lot in terms of uh, you know managing pediatric patients with contact lenses. Right. And thank you again so much for having me and inviting me. It was a pleasure doing this lecture for all of you. And um, feel free to email, reach out down the road and reconnect at any time. Sure, surely we'll do that. Thank you so much. And we do have session planned the next uh, weekend. Uh, this is about uh, complications in orthokeratology and how we should be one, avoiding them if possible. And if we have some complications, how can we go about managing them? So please do join us. Until then, take care, be safe, and hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Bye-bye.